All right, John chapter one. Now, the author's intent of the book of John, remember, is what? It's that we would believe that Jesus is God. And so, and so over and over again, that's what's gonna be reaffirmed in this book. And, and we've been seeing example after example of individuals who are pro- proclaiming that truth, that Jesus is God. We've been focused on John the Baptist the last few weeks. And the guy that was literally, he had the mission of being the forerunner to Jesus, to prepare the people for the Messiah. And and last week we saw how as John is speaking, Jesus shows up and he says, there he is, the Lamb of God. And he then shares with the crowd how not only Jesus is that, but how God confirmed that. And so today, what we're going to look at here is the next day, okay? So John chapter 1, we're going to start with verses 35 through 42, and it says this. The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Okay, so so really we we kick off this first section uh, with two disciples of John the Baptist, and they're listening to John preach, because remember, all these people, crowds, had gathered to follow John the Baptist. They were so inspired. His teaching, his message, um, just uh, the conviction with, with, with which he preached, People were coming from all over Jerusalem, and he had these disciples that were like, we're with you, okay? And so we pick up here where it's talking about two of these disciples, and one whose name is Andrew. Now, he says Andrew, Simon's brother, because Simon, Peter, as we're going to look at here, he was the famous one. As this is written um, later on, everybody knew who Peter was, and so he references Andrew as that's, that's the brother of Peter, And then the other disciple that's there, most biblical scholars believe it's John, the author of this gospel. And and, and and one of the reasons they believe that is because John does not refer to himself by name in the gospel. And so, and because of the eyewitness accounts in which he writes, in in particular in the verses we're going to read, most believe that it was Andrew and John, the actual author of this book that were there, sitting there listening to John the Baptist. And as John is is teaching, once again, he sees Jesus. And just as he had proclaimed the day before, he says, look, there's the Lamb of God. Now, this time, as he says that, these two guys, they look and they follow Jesus, okay? Okay? So so John says, look, there's the Lamb of God. This time, these two disciples of John, they look at Jesus and they go, okay, we're going to follow him. And so they start to follow Jesus. Now, the first thing that we see here that's so important is we actually get a window into the validity of John the Baptist's ministry and message and just who he was as a Jesus follower. See, John believed what he preached. Okay, he believed it. His purpose, remember his purpose, was to prepare people for the coming of Jesus. So when Jesus came, he passed his disciples along to Jesus. Okay, now, it's interesting how, you know, we really see what someone believes when what they believe actually results in an inconvenience. Amen? Amen? Right, like we can, we can say, um, like, this is what we're about, this is what we're about, but when that, what we say that we're about, is an inconvenience, 
how we respond to that communicates whether I really believe that or not. Right? When people say they believe this or believe that, or believe, but when it's really challenged, when you actually have to step out based upon that belief, that's when you see where you're really at. And what we see here uh, is John the Baptist literally saying, go follow Jesus. Go follow him. His purpose was to prepare people for Jesus. So when Jesus came, he just passed them along. And we see that, that, that literally as he's talking about this, this requires sacrifice on his part. Okay, He didn't say, hey, there's Jesus right there. That's the Lamb of God. But keep listening to me. Hey, crowd, that's Jesus. But stay here. Let's keep focused on me. He didn't say that, right? And, and, and what I see here is, one, is, is what, what is our heart? And is the message we're preaching actually the message we believe? Because often, I'll hear us say, I'll hear myself say, you should follow Jesus. Go follow Jesus. Don't leave the church, but follow Jesus. Right? Don't, don't. Or, or if it's a, a family member sometimes. It's like, hey, yes, you should follow Jesus. Don't move away. Don't, don't move to that other area. Don't, don't become a missionary. No, 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 no. But follow Jesus. Okay? Like, like we become very conditioned to saying you should follow Jesus until it inconveniences my agenda. And, that, and that's, a, that's just a kind of a, a word of caution for us because I just see this over, in fact, I've experienced this. I remember when um, I was gonna plant a church, when I did plant a church and, and I was at a very large church in San Diego and I, and I told my boss, I said, hey, I'm, I'm praying about like God, I, I feel like God's leading me to plant a church. And, and I remember his response was not what I thought it would be. I thought he'd be like, oh, that's so great, amen. But instead he went, What's wrong? What's happening? Is it me? Do you feel like you need to leave because of me? And I was like, wait a second. This is a good thing. This is a good thing. And I think sometimes we, we, we say, follow Jesus, but actually uh, when that's gonna be validated, we step away and go, wait a second. That's too much. That's gonna be too difficult. They might leave. Okay, and so we've got to ask ourselves, are we more concerned with keeping people or sending people out? Are we more concerned about gathering as a crowd or spreading the good news? One author wrote that John provides a genuine model of what it means to be a minister or servant of God. Human tendency is to make a name for ourselves and to attach our names to other people, institutions, and things so that people will remember us. To minimize oneself in order for Jesus to become the focus of attention is the designated function of an ideal witness. See, John's endorsement of Jesus is validated because he willingly gave up his influence and authority to testify to the reality of who Jesus is. He willingly gave up his followers to Jesus, validating the message and the mission that he said he was all about. Jesus sees these two individuals following him, okay? He, he sees them following him, and he, and, he, and he stops, and he asks, what are you seeking? What are you seeking? And what he's really asking there, because, you know, he had foreknowledge. He knew what they were seeking. But, but what he's really doing there is he's asking them to consider their motives, which is a great question for us. He didn't ask them whom they were seeking, but what they were seeking. See, as he's asking this, He's, he's not only setting precedence as to what he's about and what he's not about, but he's asked, actually getting once again to the core of their heart. When you, look at, when you look at the Sermon on the Mount, what is the Sermon on the Mount? It's the most famous sermon. It's all about getting to the heart of somebody. It's understanding who they really are. And that's what Jesus is right now saying is, what are you actually seeking? Where are your motives at with you following me? And, and I think it's the same question for us today, even as we're sitting here listening or we're online, 
what is my motive for being here? What is my desire? What's my hopeful outcome? And so Jesus asks, what are you seeking? And really, he's digging in. Like, like are you looking just for these assurances? Are you, are you looking for a position by following me? Because John the Baptist said that. And you go, oh, if he's greater than John, I can, I can have this position. Or maybe I can get some influence out of this. Maybe it's just the excitement, right? Like, there's the new guy. Some of us, um, we are the ones that like, whatever is new, we go after it. Like, like, it's like we're about one thing one day and we are all in. Everything, our life, our family exists for that. And then two days later, we're like, oh my goodness. And everything now is about this. And, 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 and man, if you're like that, I'm sorry, man, that is exhausting. I don't know how you do it. You're like, oh, Steve, I thrive in that. Oh, <laughs> oh. Maybe it was an escape, right? Like, like, I need an escape from my life, from my reality. Jesus provides that. Maybe it's just love, right? Maybe I've never experienced love. I've never experienced the affection of the Father. I've never, I've never, you know, John the Baptist was a taste of that. But what is Jesus? Is he greater? Maybe it's security. I just need security. This world is crazy. I need that. See, Jesus asks us the same question. What are you looking for in life? And Andrew and John, they reply to that question by asking another question. Rabbi, they say, which translated means teacher or it's a title of respect and honor. They ask, where are you staying? In other words, what they're actually asking is, can we follow you and can we have more time with you? And, 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 and this is such a defining moment that John who we believe is an eyewitness right here. Like this is such a moment for him that he writes down the actual time, okay? He, he, he literally says it's about the 10th hour. It's like 4 p.m., okay, uh, in those times by how they would uh, define the time. And so like, like some of you can remember those moments in your life that changed your life and you can remember the actual time. You remember where you were at. You remember what you were doing. And this was such an impactful moment for John the moment that he asked Jesus, where are you staying? Because we want to go stay with you. We want more time with you. He says, that changed everything about me. And so I'm going to put that time down. It's going to be in the inspired word of God. <laughs> and, so, and so we have it there. It's about 4 p.m. The day is drawing to a close. Darkness was approaching. And instead of seeking shelter, Andrew and John sought the Savior. And Jesus responds by saying this, come and you'll see. Master, where are you staying? Well, come and you will see. So Jesus invites them to come and to see. And just as he invites them to come and to see, he invites you and I to our questions, to our desires. He says, come and see. See, we all seek something. Jesus invites us to come and discover in him all we'll ever need. Come and see how he will fill the emptiness that's inside each and every one of us. See, he knew they were honestly seeking him. One of the things that is so powerful in scripture is we see that the honest seeker always finds him. I, man, I, I just feel like sometimes we think that he's playing hide and go seek with us. And he's like, hey, find me, but I'm gonna hide. It's not what he does, you guys. Like we see it all throughout scripture. In Deuteronomy 4, 29, it says, but from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you search after him with all your heart and with all your soul. That's what Moses says, the nation of Israel. In Jeremiah 29, 13, the prophet says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So you will seek me and you will find me. That's, that, that, that's God's message. And just as he promised later on in John chapter 7, 17, when he says this, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my, know, my own authority. In other words, if I am earnestly desiring God, Christ's will in my life, he's going to reveal it, he's going to show it, and I'm not going to have to go, oh my goodness, God, are you there? Do you know? No, he provides. He meets you in that space. When you seek throughout scripture, you find. Zacchaeus, uh, we, we see this short little tax collector guy in Luke chapter 19. He climbs up in this tree because Jesus had, 
uh, had developed this big following around him. And as he's walking into town, all these people are there. Zacchaeus is just a little guy, and he climbs up into this tree, and he looks. He's seeking. What does Jesus do? Cut that tree down. No. <laughs> I mean, he was an evil dude. If I was Jesus, I'd be like, branch break. Jesus says, hey, you, get down here. Come on, fella. I'm coming to your house. I'm going to your house. Seek and find. You guys, Jesus, all throughout his ministry, he showed compassion for those that were seeking and those that were even confused as to what they were seeking. In Matthew chapter 9, 36, says this. Jesus is, 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 is looking at these crowds that are gathering, and he says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were, were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Guys, when I see people say things, post things, uh, talk about all these things, and I look at a lot of these things as a cry for help. One of the things that, that I pray that God continually guards my heart and my mind with is looking at them and going, oh, good riddance, get out. Because I want to look at people the way Jesus was able to look at people. The very people that were gonna criticize him, the very people that were gonna put him on a cross, and, and because he is almighty God and models to us something different, he's able to look at those very people and have compassion, knowing that they need a savior, they need a shepherd. That's what Jesus brought. It had a huge impact, this conversation, as Jesus, throughout the night, shares with these guys all these different things that you can only imagine about how Scripture points to who he is, how he's the fulfillment. And then afterwards, Andrew goes to get his brother, and he says to his brother, we found the Messiah, Messiah is a transliteration of a Hebrew or Aramaic, Aramaic term that means anointed one. We have found him. He goes and he gets Peter, as we know him now, and says, I've, we found him. I found the Messiah. And, and, and when we see this anointed one, this term in the Old Testament, it was used of the high priests, the kings, the patriarchs, and the people of God. But here, this is supremely referred to the prophesied coming of God's anointed deliverer, the king, the son of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, we found the Messiah. When you see this word found here, it implies someone who was diligently searching for something and then they joyously discover it. In Matthew 13, there's a parable. Uh, and in the parable, the parable is a short story that, that connected with the audience that, that delivered incredible truth. And in Matthew 13, it says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sell all, sells all that he has and buys that field. So the, it, it, the kingdom of heaven, when you experience it, when you find it, it brings such joy that you look around and you bury it up and you go, you don't tell anybody, and you purchase it because you want all of it. My, my nephew is a huge sports cards collector. And he always wants to talk to me about, about his, his collection of cards. And last time they were here, he told me a story how they were in Fred Meyer and he saw this special box of sports cards. And his mom, he asked his mom, can I have that? And she said, no. So he proceeded to tell me how he hid that box of sports cards behind a whole bunch of dolls in a, in a section that nobody who's collecting sports cards would look. And he goes home and tells his dad, my brother, dad, you won't believe what Fred Meyer had. And my brother took him and got the box of cards. He had found something, and he was determined to get it, and he was excited. Now, they've got to work on their parenting, but I'm going to tell you right now, you guys, when you experience Christ in your life, when you experience what happens, it is not just this, 
oh, good, I'm good. Like, no, you, you go and you tell the most important people that are in your life. Who does he go to? He goes to his brother immediately. Immediately after his evening with Jesus, he's like, where's my brother? He goes and he gets his brother and, and, and he acknowledges, we have been searching. We have been looking for this. We finally found him. I have to tell you, I have to tell you about, and, and what's so awesome is as we see this joy, this excitement, he not only delivers that information to him that we found it, but what does he do? He says, come with me, come and see. And he takes Peter to Jesus. You guys, Andrew is only mentioned three times in the book of John, and each time he's bringing someone to Jesus. Jesus meets Simon, and he changes his name to Cephas, the Aramaic word for rock, which is Peter in the Greek. He gives him a new name, the name that we know him as, this divinely appointed nickname. Now, nicknames, I was thinking about this, nicknames are usually based on a past event or some defining characteristic, okay? Now, I've had nicknames, and some, I'm like, that's cool, and some, I'm like, that needs to go, okay? And, and all the nicknames that I've ever had were, were uh, either something that had happened that I was a part of, or there was just something about me that made sense with that nickname. Um, it was Thanksgiving, and I heard a lot of gobbles, because my name is Goble, and it just apparently goes together. But we see these nicknames, and some of us have had nicknames. And, and, but when God, when we see God change a name, it's often a prophetic name. It's a prophetic nickname, a way for him to declare his intent for that person. We see Abram in the Old Testament. His name was changed to Abraham because it says in Genesis 75, you're going to become, uh, you're going to be the father of many nations. So that's what your name is going to become. Jacob needed to become Israel. You know, Peter, uh, when we look at his life and him being changed to the name Peter, to the rock, everything about his life would, would actually speak to him not being a rock. In fact, we would look at him and go, what's the opposite of a rock? It's Peter, right? He's the one unstable all over the place. Emotionally, he's reactionary like person. Uh, and, and, and yet what we see is Christ saying to Simon, you are going to be transformed into the rock, into Peter. And guess what? It happens. You guys, this is, what, this is what he does in every single person that puts their faith and their hope and their trust in him. He takes you on this incredible journey of transformation to where now what defines you is not what used to define you. And, 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 and that's the message. That's what we see over and over and over again. In the words of uh, D.A. Carson, when he's looking at this passage, he said, the focus is much less on what this name change means for Peter than on the Jesus who knows people thoroughly and not only sees into them, but so calls them that he makes them what he calls them to be. As we, as we keep going in verse, verses 43 through 51 of chapter one in John, it says, the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of God. The next day, we see Jesus 
heads to Galilee and finds Philip and he says, hey, you, follow me. Nathaniel, like Andrew, Peter and John was from, or Philip was, was from Bethsaida, a fishing village located on the northeast shore of the Sea of Galilee. And Philip, as, as he hears the message, as a response to the calling, once again, we see him not being able to contain his excitement. And, and what does he do? He immediately goes and finds his friend, Nathaniel. Now, who is Nathaniel? Well, many, many believe that Nathaniel uh, is listed in the Synoptic Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where they give very similar accounts, and yet John gives very different accounts. Uh, many people uh, uh, believe that, that Nathaniel is actually Bartholomew because in those other Gospels, they speak of Bartholomew, but they don't speak of Nathaniel. And so most believe that Nathaniel was his given name and that Bartholomew was his family name. Um, but either way, we see that Nathaniel, when he uh, hears uh, who Jesus is, he doesn't respond in the way we would want to highlight in the Bible. Okay, because first of all, how does Philip identify Jesus? He says, hey, he's, he's, he's Joseph's son, right? He's Joseph's son from Nazareth. Now, as he's saying this, he's not denying the virgin birth. See, Jesus was viewed as Joseph's son, even though he wasn't, well, that's what he was legally, but he wasn't bio, bio, biologically uh, Joseph's son. And so Nathaniel responds to Jesus as Joseph's son, to Jesus as being from Nazareth. And, and, and Nathaniel knows, like, like, there's no prophecy that says, hey, the Messiah is gonna come from Nazareth. So he's like, why in the world would the Messiah come from an insignificant town like this? See, Nathaniel only knew where Jesus grew up. He didn't know his birthplace. It's interesting here because Philip doesn't debate with his friend, right? He doesn't say, no, you're wrong. Well, listen, listen to who Jesus really is. No, he says something very simple. Come and see. See, Philip knew his friend's doubts would be answered when he met Jesus. And as he walks up to Jesus, Jesus sees Nathanael and he says, behold, an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. He's saying, that guy right there, he's truthful. He's authentic. He's not a schemer. He's not a hypocrite. He's not a deceiver. That guy right there. He's the real deal. And Nathaniel asks, how do you know me? Right? He's still skeptical. He doesn't just go, oh, you know me. No, he says, how do you know me? And then Jesus' reply is even more shocking, right? What, what does he say there in verse 48? Um, Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. So not only did Jesus supernaturally see Nathaniel's physical location, but he also saw into his heart. Like, like this is crazy it's, it, it, to just think that Jesus is, is, is literally saying, hey, when you were under that fig tree, now we don't know what was going on under the fig tree. We don't know if he had this incredible moment with God. He said things to God he's never said before, something that God spoke to him, connected with him, and it had never happened before. But Jesus says, listen, before Philip reached out to you, I saw where you were at, I saw that moment, and I know about it. And however he spoke that, literally Nathaniel is just absolutely in shock. He can't believe it. He can't believe that, that, that literally God in his sovereignty could know exactly where he was at and what was going on in his heart. You guys, even when we don't see God, he's there. He's fully aware of all that's happening in our lives. No matter how distant you feel, no matter how isolated you may think you are, he is always there. It, I remember growing up, that was what my parents used to tell me to keep me out of trouble. I would go somewhere and they say, hey, just so you know, he's always watching. Now with technology today, parents can always be watching. But that's what they would say. 
And I, to this day, if I'm in a situation, I'm a, it's ingrained in me to go, oh my goodness, he is watching. But, but it's, not, it's not something that, that was meant to draw fear. It's, it, it's an incredible truth that he's with us all the time and he's there and he knows your thoughts, your intentions. He knows what's going on in your heart, your circumstances. I love how David puts it. In Psalm 139, one through four, he says, "'O Lord, you have searched me and known me. "'You know when I sit down and when I rise up. "'You discern my thoughts from afar. "'You search out my path and my lying down "'and are acquainted with all my ways. "'Even before a word is on my tongue, "'behold, O Lord, you know it all together. "'What's difficult is some of us have had a word on our tongue and we held it and we thought we got away with it. Ooh, I almost said it. Yeah, he saw that. So I might as well say it. No. <laughs> but he sees that. He knows. Like, I love this about God. And, and, and so, you guys, as he's speaking this to Nathaniel, all of Nathaniel's doubts are removed, and we see him just exclaim, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Like, in that moment, he hears what he, he couldn't believe he could ever hear, and he just exclaims and cries out, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. And we see these two titles actually used uh, in, uh, of the Messiah in Psalm chapter two, verse six and seven, where it says, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Jesus' father wasn't Joseph, okay? And now Nathaniel is saying that. It was the God of the universe. You are the son of God. The Old Testament described the Messiah as the king of Israel. He, he says, you're the king of Israel. And, and, and the prophet we see in Zephaniah 3.15, it says, the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again Fear Israel. We see with the palm trees, Palm Sunday, declaring the king is here. What did they do to mock Jesus? They put the king of the Jews, right, mocking him. But he's the son of God. He's, a, he's the king of Israel. And, and, and Jesus then responds again to Nathaniel, and he says, oh, you think that's special? You will see greater things than these. You will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, when he says, you will see, this is actually plural, and he's saying, you all will see. Now, you all will see what? What, what, what is he talking about? Well, he's likely alluding to, in the Old Testament, Jacob had this gnarly dream uh, in which he saw angels ascending and descending from heaven on a ladder. And the point of this statement is that Jesus is the link between heaven and earth, the revealer of heavenly truth to humanity. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, it says, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. Jesus is that mediator between God and man. He is the latter. He's the only way into the presence of God. This passage ends with Jesus then calling himself the son of man, a title he loved for himself. And he's taking that title from Daniel chapter seven, verse 13, where he looks ahead to the Messiah and he says, I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. Jesus, even by his name, he's affirming and confirming to these disciples that they're right about who they say he is. But guys, I wanna, I wanna go back to the first words that we see Jesus speak in the book of John, back in verse 38. He asks, once again, what are you seeking? And, and, I, and I just feel like it's important for us in this moment to really dig into that and ask, what am I seeking? What am I seeking in life right now? 
What defines the drive, the intention? What is the focus of my mind when I wake up in the morning, when I put my head on my pillow at night? What is driving that? What am I seeking after? You go, well, I don't know. Well, well, usually it's what is consuming your mind right now. What is your focus? What do you find yourself continually thinking about? And just as Jesus is like, hey, you're following me. What, what are you actually seeking? I think we got to ask that question for us. What does that really mean for us? I think for some of us, it means something different. And I think for some of us, when we actually look at what, we're, what, we, what we are actually seeking, we will find that it's not him. That's a scary thought. Is I think for some of us, we're just doing this. I think for some of us, he's part of the buffet options of the good or the blessed life. I think for some of us, it's because my parents, it's because of my family, it's my situation. But guys, I think, I think it starts with honesty before God. See, that's, that's what Jesus saw in Nathaniel. He said, okay, this guy's honest. This guy's not going to pretend to be something he's not. He's not going to be like these Pharisees. He's not going to put up a front. This guy's the real deal. You guys, you have to start from a place of honesty. You have to start from a place of truth. And part of that is maybe even admitting my intentions are off. My focus is off. And then what I love here is, is we see these guys that, that didn't fully understand, didn't fully know, were skeptical, but curious, and, and, and I see that, that even as Philip is introducing Jesus and saying, hey, he's the son of Joseph, he's not saying he's the son of God yet, we see one of the awesome things about scripture is this. Jesus reaches down into our life regardless of how much you know or don't know, regardless of how large your faith is or how small it is, he responds to where we seek him. So when I seek him, he attaches himself to me and he walks with me willingly on this process of discipleship, this process of transformation. And so for some of us, we're like, man, I got to know this, I got to know that, and I, and I got to get all the information here before I'm going to follow him. You guys, one of the beauties of the gospel, and as we see Jesus come on the scene, is who he picks, and we see how much they don't know, how much doubt they had, how much faith they lacked at times. And yet Jesus still willfully attached himself to them and walked with them into a greater faith. He wants to do that with you. He wants to do that with other people. If your knowledge or your information is holding you back from receiving him, look at these individuals. And, and, and I love how Jesus says, come and you'll see. When they ask where are you saying, come and you'll see. Philip invited Nathaniel. He said what? Come and see. Uh, Andrew found Peter. He said what? Come and see. You guys, when Philip approached Nathaniel and Nathaniel said, what good could come out of Nazareth? That place is not where a Messiah is gonna come from. That was like the invitation for a debate, right? If it was on social media, lots of comments. Like it just is. And, and that's what we would think. In a situation like that or someone questions my faith, what do I think? Oh, it's go time. Time to convince you into Jesus, Right? but we missed the whole point here. He does not debate his buddy. What does he say? Come and see. Guys, we are great at delivering information. And it's never been easier to deliver information or verses to people. The question is, and, and this is what was really hitting me as I studied this, is where is the come and see part? Where is that? Where is that in my life? See, we've gone from come and see to let me try to out-debate you into the kingdom of God. What does come and see, come and see Jesus, what does that look like to you when you think about that? Is there actual evidence in your life that you've even found something? Guys, what we see over and over is when they find Jesus, when they, when they understand who he is, is life-changing. Is there evidence that you found something? 
And Jesus made a promise to his disciples. He says, you will see. And Jesus invites us to come and see what we really need. Guys, we all seek something. He invites us to come and discover in him all we'll ever need. Only he can fill the emptiness inside us. We are, man, we are surrounded by people frantically looking for hope, distorted from everything around them. And they're, they're literally crying out, help me. And will I be the one running to them saying, I found the Messiah, come and see. And at the core of it is, does my response to those cries for help validate the message that I'm preaching just like John the Baptist? It's, all, it's always gonna come back to what am I actually doing? What, what is my life communicating? Does it validate what's coming out of my mouth? Guys, let's really think about that. Let's consider what we're seeking. Let's consider what does it mean to come and see? What does that invitation look like if you're gonna invite someone into that? Let's pray. God.